Hi folks, I'm Richard Friedman and welcome to my political cartoon countdown for September 25th, 2021. Every week or so we get together and I we get together and do the countdown based upon impressions on Twitter of the top political cartoons of the week based on, on really on popularity and uh, it's quantified and I put it in order and I just shoot it out to you. And um, uh, before we get started on that, I'd like to tell you a little about myself. I, I was a math teacher and I turned cartoonist and I've been doing that for a number of years, wrote a number of books, started off on the Trump presidency and now doing general political cartoon books to encompass everybody. And, um, and basically, uh, if you like, you can, uh, you can go to my website, which is Richard's Books of Political Cartoons.com. That's no apostrophe on the S and no spaces, just plain Richard's Books of Political Cartoons.com. And there you'll see all my work and all my latest, not my latest cartoons, but the cartoons from my books as previews. And if you want to see my current cartoons, you can go to my uh, page on Twitter, which is Bronx Cartoonist uh, handle RJF Cartoons. I'm from the Bronx, and uh, and I like to. I kind of just took that as a as part of my uh, present presentation. Uh, so. Anyway, um, I would hope you would go there and enjoy the cartoons. And if you decide to buy the book, it's right. The link to Amazon is right on the website, uh, on my website, or you can go directly to Amazon. Uh, so that again, that's Richard's books of politicalcartoons.com. And I invite you to no, no admission charge to get on the website. And uh, what we do every week, I like to just give you an overview of my books and kind of flashback to what was happening in 2020 on the, almost this, to this date, one year ago. So this was my book, my 2020 book right here. The greatest 2020 book of political cartoons on the Donald J. Trump presidency. And uh, this was happening one year ago, just one year ago today, around this time, very for, for close to it. Here we have Mike, uh, who have, I always confuse Mike with Chris Wallace. This is Chris, his son. Uh, obviously, Mike isn't, isn't around anymore. He, he was the guy from 60 Minutes. Well, anyway, here is, here we have here, this, this cartoon. You can see the date over here. That was the 29th of September, 2020. Okay. And here we have Chris Wallace. This is the first debate. I did a uh, kind of a first debate uh, between then candidate Joe Biden and then President Donald Trump. This is their first debate. And there's Chris Wallace up there. And uh, the first presidential debate, 2020, on the coronavirus pandemic topic. They did it on topics. So this is on the coronavirus pandemic topic. An exchange between moderator Chris Wallace and President Trump. Uh, this question was directed to President Trump, okay? I, I said conceivable, okay? <laughs> All right, qualify that. Okay, so here goes Chris Wallace here. Here's, here's Chris Wallace. He's right up there. And he asks, how can you support President Trump? President Trump, how can you support your view that the U.S. is, quote, rounding the turn on the coronavirus when the COVID-19 crisis is devastating Arizona, South Carolina, Texas, Florida, and Georgia, and your own CC CDC director has suggested your newly appointed coronavirus advisor has made nothing but false statements? So the CDC, the CDC director is breaking with uh, former President Trump's coronavirus advisor. And he's saying there's not much false statements coming out of the guy. So here, so here goes President Trump responding to that question. There's, there's former President Trump responding. This is, supposed to, this is Joe Biden here from the back. Oh, 
Okay, and here's former President Trump. And here goes the answer, President, former President Trump's answer to Chris Walsh's question. We have rounded the turn on the coronavirus. My CDC director is confused and incorrect on how we close, on how close, how close we are to a vaccine. And that makes, and that, and that masks, masks are more powerful than vaccine. My decision to restrict travel from China saved thousands of lives. Between our record rapid testing on the China virus, the China virus, very soon vaccines ready to go, and the spectacular job Governor DeSantis is doing in opening up Florida, our, our fantastic recovery is just going to break all records. I, I'll do it again. Okay, well, Governor Sanders broke a lot of records on that one. <laughs> For today, he's breaking a lot of records. Okay, so that was from a year ago. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay, that was the, the flashback from a year ago. And this is my latest book here. And you see all the characters. Former President Trump, the pillow man, Mike Lindell. Uh, I think that's, that's John Bolton with his new book. There's a ghost of Nixon. There's Barr. President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris. There's Sean Hannity up there. I put him there. There's Dr. Fauci. There's Matt Gates. Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi. The Trump supporters. There's a Rudy Giuliani. Okay. Ted Cruz here. The Twitter bird. Okay. That was the cover of my book for 2020. All the characters here, they're all on the pages of the book. Yeah, you can see some of that. I even brought back uh, the All in the Family crew for a, for a cartoon flashback. Here's Bar. of the Justice Department. Okay, so that was my 2020 book. This is a 2019 book. First, in 2019, I did two books like I'm doing for 2021. That was the, the first book, and there'll be another book coming out. Still, still around, I'm still around, you know? So, so that was that, okay. So this was broken down in 2019. It was broken down into two books, volume one, volume two, for the first and second six months of the year. And there we go. There was a, the volume two with the White House in the background. And here was my first book. This covered the, uh, the debate. We had Democrats in here too. A number of cartoons on Democrats. We had Okay, let's see. Yeah. Here we have Hillary. We have Hillary Clinton with Bernie Sanders and Trump coming in. These were cartoons from the from back in 2016. Okay. 
Okay. This former president, President George H. Uh, George, excuse me, George W. Bush. That's his mom, and that was uh, she was she was then uh, campaigning for Jeb Bush. So I drew her. She was getting very uh, aggressive in her campaigning for Jeb back in 2016. Okay. Okay, so they saw all my books. And now I, we hit the cartoon countdown. Okay, this was number we have here today. Four, this was numero cuatro de la semana, number four. Here we have Attorney General Merrick Garland. Trump is watching him on TV here. Former, former President Trump is watching him, is watching Attorney General Merrick Garland on television here. And the thumbs up. That's the title of this cartoon. You don't see it here. Former President Trump gives thumbs up to Biden's Attorney General Merrick Garland. Okay, there it is. Okay. Former President Trump watches Biden's Attorney General Merrick Garland and praises Garland for his, for his decisions that have been favorable to Trump. He's made quite a number, not a lot, but a considerable amount of decisions in favor of the former president. And so here's an example. The Justice Department announced it will appeal a federal judge's order to release an internal Justice Department memo from the Trump years dealing with the Robert Mueller report. So he's basically saying he's directing his just, Justice Department to overrule a judge who wanted to uh, to bring out a memo from in, in, in the in, from Trump world, a memo that would be released. But uh, but the, the Justice Department is doing just the opposite of what you think a Justice Department would do in trying to get the facts out and everything. But they're doing that. They're saying we're going to try to appeal this federal judge's decision to release those memos. So, and um, I did some reading on, um, with due respect to uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland, I did some reading about him and his philosophy, uh, how it applies here, and basically his philosophy is that we should let the past stay in the past, and we have to move onward, and we have to be uh, basically looking ahead to the future, and he, he makes an analogy that the ship will right itself, you know? The ship will right itself, we just do the right thing. And this, this is kind of what I read. And the thing about it is that I would say if to, uh, to Attorney General uh, Garland that there were things done that weren't too cool, wasn't too legal, that, 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 that if you, you can't bury, you can't bury, uh, You'd like to walk away, but you, if you bury it, then somebody else comes along, does the same thing, and you, you, they want, if you forget about history, you, 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 you're doomed to repeat it, you know? So, so the idea is not to repeat this episode and prevent it from happening again, but if we just go along and say, well, you know, the ship will right itself, we just have to do the right thing. And then again, here, he's saying basically, that he doesn't want to turn the Justice Department into a witch hunting thing against Trump. Not to be, you know, he doesn't want to be like, he called, he used to coin the phrase de Trump, de Trumpification. He said, we don't want any de Trumpification or witch hunts against former President Trump. Granted, he said that, okay? All right. So, okay. But then he, he, he says now, this is something else, he goes on to say, uh, to uh, basically rule that the investigation into the people who were investigating pres former President Trump, that, that, that it came up with no evidence, concrete evidence whatsoever, you know, kind of like the election deal, you know, the, you know, so it came up with no evidence. He wants that to continue. So he's going to, he, on, on the basis of the fact that there was one person, a lawyer, 
who didn't uh, speak out that he uh, that he was uh, that he was connected with Hillary Clinton or had he represented, I don't know whether he represented her or he was connected, but he had some affiliation with Hillary Clinton and he didn't represent that to, I think, the FBI. Again, I'm just kind of just thinking back and that the FBI was duped into thinking that, that this man was on his own making these statements, but he was really connected to Hillary Clinton. So on the basis of that, uh, it seems that way. On the basis of that, Garland saying we've got to move forward with tr with this uh, investigation to, to in, into the people, Mueller's people, or whatever, who are investigating for him. And there's no evidence that it could come up with, because you can be sure uh, if President Trump was president then, and those people would be locked up. They would be <laughs> they would be in the courts now. But but you know there's been no evidence to that effect. But he's saying we've got to go ahead and move with this thing. So in other words, it has to work both ways, which is what he's saying, and I'm saying to, to Garland, to, to Attorney General Garland, it has to work both ways. Basically, if you're not going to go after Trump, how can you then turn around and go after, after the people who investigated Trump when there's no facts? Only the fact is, this one guy, uh, you know, I don't want to mention his, his attorney, you know, who came out and said that there was, a, that, that, uh, that, that the, uh, there was information that, uh, that he, you know, he had some information that may or may not been true about former President Trump that he brought forward, and that that information, whatever it was, was, was very questionable because he didn't reveal his connection to Hillary Clinton, which is the point. That's the essence of it, and that's because he didn't reveal his connection to Hillary Clinton. That this investigation into the people who investigated under Mueller has to continue. And this is what Garland's saying. So you can't have it both ways. You got to treat everybody fair, and you're going to say you have to. You got to walk the walk. Like this goes back to to President uh, uh, George W. Bush. He said you got to talk, talk, walk. You gotta, if you're going to walk, you got to talk, and you got to walk. If you talk, you got to walk the talk. And here, uh, I don't think Garland is mess. Is, uh, Attorney General Garland is really uh, walking his talk. Because he's saying one thing, we've got to be fair to everybody and keep everybody equal. And then he's going after a lot of innocent people who worked on that uh, Mueller investigation are now under the gun for, for, for basically for, for non -tri for trivial matter that this one guy, this one lawyer, didn't say he was connected to Hillary Clinton. So there you go. You're going to, so he's saying now that he, he says the ship has to keep going along, keep sailing, and the ship will ride itself. You know, it's like on the Titanic, when you hit the iceberg, the captain looks out here, oh, we hit a high, well, oh, we got a lot of water coming in there. Well, let's keep going full speed, full speed ahead. We gotta, we're going to beat this, this thing, you know? We're going we're gonna to ride it out, you know? Ride out, to put the, the, speed, the Titanic into full speed after hitting, after hitting the iceberg, you know? That's what, you know, anyway... <laughs> I'm not, I just want you to think about things. I'm not trying to make you think either way. I just give you the facts as what I read, and you decide about that. So anyway, so then here um, I have this cartoon where, we, where, where, where former President Trump is watching Garland here, Attorney General Garland up here, and, he say, and he's saying, what a waste of Garland's great judicial philosophy it would have been if the Republican-controlled Senate back then had not blocked Garland's nomination to the Supreme Court by Obama. Obama had nominated him in his last few months or last month or two towards the end of his presidency, and the Republicans and Mitch McConnell wanted no part of that. They said, no, it's too late. In the, in the, it, it, we got a new president coming in, and we're going to wait and see what happens, you know? And then that president will decide who, 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 who comes in. That was after Justice Ginsburg, I believe it was Justice Ginsburg, passed away. You see, I believe so, you know. It could, well, I think so, okay? I give it about an 80%. That was, that was for Phil Justice Ginsburg's uh, um, seat on the Supreme Court, who had passed away, okay? So, so then, control sent back then and not blocked Garland's nomination to the Supreme Court by Obama. So, so Garland was nominated to the Supreme Court by Obama, and it, it never went any place because the Republicans under McC McConnell blocked it. And that, if, if they didn't block it, he would have been on Supreme Court, and he couldn't be around to help President Trump now as Attorney General, because he couldn't have been an Attorney General and on the Supreme Court at the same time, right? We know that, you know? So, so this Garland is going to really F dot dot up a lot of liberal Dems, you know, because all this, he, he has a background. He has a, a connection to the liberals, you know? And Obama nominated him. He wasn't really like a real... Bernie Sanders type of liberal, you know, <laughs> you know, 
but he was like, you know, kind of like, um, I don't know, I don't want to make any names, but he was kind of leading, you know, he was like a in between sort of like a little bit, you know, the liberals said, well, okay, take a look at him, you know, we don't like, we don't like him that much, but we'll look at him, you know, so that was that, that kind of thing, you know, so really, the liberals then really F dot dot up a lot of liberal Dems, you know, when I am reelected in 2024, I might even keep him on as attorney general, you know, he'd be a good replacement for Barr, because this is a man with a philosophical position, and he's going to say this and that, and he, and he, you know, he's not going to go out, maybe not go out golfing with uh, the President Trump the, the, in the second term. I don't think Gar he'll see Garland on the golf course with, uh, with then, if he became President 24, it would be President Trump. Uh, he's not going to, he's not going to say, you're not going to see Garland out on the golf course with, with President Trump, like some other Supreme Court. Or like you know some other people you know, let's put it that way. So so there you go. I don't think he's going to do any golfing with the new, the new president, President Trump, if he's elected president in 2024. So, but he would probably consider keeping him on. I bet he would. So I I wrote that in there here in my when I am reelected in 24, I might even keep him on as attorney general. You know. Yes, thumbs up. Thumbs up. All right, well, okay, so much for that. All right, New Meadow, Trace de la Semana. Here we have Mitch McConnell getting a truth injection. Okay, he's getting a truth injection. This is his first one, first truth, first truth injection he's getting here. Okay. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell gets a sodium pentothal, tr quote, uh, in parenthesis, truth in serum shot. After saying, we will not support legislation that raises the debt, debt, debt limit. Okay? So he's not supporting the, uh, the leg to raise the debt, which is going to be an economic catastrophe uh, for the United States if that were to come to pass. We couldn't pay our debts. Imagine we couldn't pay our debt debts to China, what they could do to the interest rates that we, they're charging us, you know? Think about that. <laughs> you know, we can't pay our, our uh, interest. We, so our credit rating would go, would drop, boom. Standard and poor, it would be poor, poor United States. You know? So, so anyway. And Democrats do not need our help to raise the debt limit. So here I'm kind of saying, this is word for word what he said. They don't need the help to, because we're going to say, let them, let them pass on a resolution, and then they'll take the heat for this tremendous uh, increase in the debt. You know, let the Democrats take the heat for this. In the meantime, and you know, we'll just we'll just slide in there, and and get our, our people reelected, along with uh, President Trump. You know, and given and President Trump would be saying, "Look, a little debt ceiling." You know, I remember Reagan went on TV once and he said, "If you take our debt and you put dollar bills on it, if it could if it go like three quarters of the way to the moon or something like that, <laughs> you know, some kind of analogy like that. President, former President Reagan said that. Meanwhile, he, he, uh, he, he uh, increased the defense and he cut spending, he lowered taxes and, and increased the, the deficit too, but not to this extent, you know. You know, I, I tell you the truth, I voted for President Reagan and, you know, I was, I, after, after all those 20% interests, interest rates with Jimmy Carter. I was trying to do real estate then too uh, with my teaching and boy that was 20 percent you really had to be creative in financing to get deals done you know you had to do all kinds of, of balloon mortgage uh, wrap around mortgages to balloon it out in seven years and you had to do, you had to be real real creative to make a deal because 20 percent you know imagine 20 percent interest rates that's what we had back in around 1980. You know, I remember that. I took this uh, summer off from teaching, and I was doing real estate, working like a son of a gun on the, on the hot streets in the summertime, and going up to buildings, knocking on doors, and uh, in my broken down Chevy. <laughs> you know, I used to park at three, go up to these homes where people own these buildings, park my Chevy about three or four blocks away, and walk up, and walk up to the house with a with a, with a, with a suit looked like, you know, looked like, you know, looked like I was running for president, you know. But, but uh, and some guy said, "Where's your car?" Oh, I said, "Well, I, I really got a little lost, you know, and, and I wasn't sure." And I went out the directions. I found out it was real close, so I just walked over here, you know. 
<laughs> you know. <laughs> so anyway, that's the story. So and given the limit was raised with bipartisan support three times during the Trump administration. So the debt, the debt ceiling, the debt limit, was raised three times during the Trump administration, and the high limit will allow the government to make payments on existing debt. So not only will uh, they're, they're talking about, oh, we don't want the government the, with this, uh, this new uh, infrastructure bill, this resolution bill, you know? So, so anyway, um, so, so anyway, uh, basically, that's what, that's what they're saying here, you know? They're saying basically that, that they don't, they do not want to raise the debt limit the way they did for President Trump, and they're going to let the United States just hang in the wind, you know. And here is uh, McConnell getting in this scenario. McConnell gets a booster shot, okay. And he goes, "Do you want a booster truth shot in six months?" Okay. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. This, this is number, I'm oh, sorry, this is number one. Okay. This, this sets up a win-win situation for Republicans. If the U.S. defaults on its debt, the deficit, this is thinking about not raising the debt ceiling. McConnell's thinking under, under the influence of truth serum that he's been given here. This sets up a win-win situation for Republicans. If the U.S. defaults on its debt, the devastating economic impact will be blamed on Democrats. And if Senate Democrats amend their $3.5 trillion infrastructure resolution bill to include an allowance for the debt to be increased with only Democrat votes so they can do a resolution and they can raise the debt ceiling without the Republicans and they take responsibility for the debt and everything like that, you know, then we can put all this debt on the backs of Democrats. Even though the national debt rose by almost 7.8 trillion during Trump's time in office, so during former President Trump's time, you had these tax cuts for the very wealthy, you know, that that even surpassed the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy. We went, took it out there. You know, the the idea was of a trickle down economics because these people would have more money, the corporations would invest more in jobs and in pay in pay raises, and everybody would be happy, you know. But it didn't work out that way. But I think what I read happened was a lot of the people they bought back, they, in these corporations, they bought back their own, they did stock buybacks and bought back their own stock for the money they got. And they just raised the prices on stuff anyway, going up, going up now. So it didn't work out that way. But it, it, on paper, I guess it sounded pretty good. You know, and the Republicans didn't argue with that, and they passed it, you know. So all that money, 7.8 trillion. I don't think it was all for tax. I don't think it was all on the tax cut, but a good, I'm sure a good chunk of it was probably so, you know. So so anyway, so then the the, uh, the guy giving the doctor giving him the truth serum shot says, uh, Senator McConnell, do you want a booster truth shot in six months? Do you want a booster six? Do you want a booster in six months in case it wears off, you know? And then you, you gotta go back. You can't, you have to, to you can't, you're off the, 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 the truth deal. You, know, you, gotta, you gotta start telling, you know, you, you gotta keep telling the truth. After six months, you can say anything you want because you won't be compelled by the drug to speak the truth anymore. So he's saying, well, you want that for, if it wears off, you wanna go another six, take a shot for another six months to have to tell the truth for another six months. And then McConnell responds here. Here's McConnell's response. No, I'm afraid of an allergic reaction. So he's afraid that telling the truth would create an allergic reaction. That's the punchline. <laughs> okay, again, you think it's your deal. I give you the facts for some jokes, and you decide. Okay, now, this is, okay, this is his coming down to, this is number, numero tres, de la semana. Well, no, actually, this is coming up to number two. We go up to number one, this is number two of the, of the week. Second best on Twitter.
new metal dose. Okay. So now you got you, you have to guess who this is, you know, on on the goat. You have to make a guess to understand this cartoon. And I'm not gonna say it because if I say tell, tell you who it is, it won't mean anything because if you didn't know by now, when I tell you the joke, then it ain't telling you the name of the person it ain't gonna mean anything. You know? So I, I, I don't wanna create a uh, something like I don't have to create, you know? So if you can't tell who this is, then then I, I say to you, try to, to use your imagination a little harder. Okay. Oh, and this is, uh, there's Lindsey Graham in here. That's Lindsey. And here's former President, here's former President Trump. Okay. Senator Lindsey Graham tries to play peacemaker between former President Donald Trump and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. See, they got, they got a little, when, after the January 6th riots at the Capitol, McConnell came out and said well, that, that, for, that now former President Trump was responsible, uh, held, held some responsibility for that riot and basically instigated it to happen in so many words. He, he said that he was morally morally and rationally and reasonably or whatever, responsible. So he, those were his words. So former President Trump, you know, he, he, he didn't like that too much, or then President Trump. So since then, there has not been, uh, you know, a good relationship. So anyway, sent my leader, Mitch McConnell. So here we have, again, tries to play. So now Lindsey Graham is trying to make peacemaker between McConnell and Trump because he's looking ahead to the, the elections now, he wants to get Republicans elected, you know, and if people against who are for for um, for McConnell, and they see that, that that Trump is against him, it could change a lot of people going the other way, getting getting pissed off at at, at Trump, or or the vice versa could happen. So it could it it it, it deunifies the party, the because Trump is the head of the Republican Party, and you have a, it's like a it's like a, a, a it's like a, a schism in here in the party, you know, because Trump, he, McConnell has been there and he's been the, the you know, he's been the, the big Republican boss of the Senate, of, of, the, of the Republicans, why they had a majority, or the Republicans had a majority, and now in the minority position, he's ex exercising a lot of influence as well. So he's been the powerhouse there, and, and, and Trump is saying, he, Trump is the powerhouse of the whole party, you know? not just in the Senate. So, so there you have this, this potential for a, for a, a deunifying de effect. So McC Mitch, Mitch is not doing this as a, as a Boy Scout. You say, I want to make, let them make friends, you know, and gumbaya kind of thing, you know, gumbaya. It's not that, like that. He's thinking ahead to the 2022 uh, midterm elections and taking back, the Republicans taking back the Senate. That's what he's thinking ahead to. You see, wanting them to be, to be good buddies, you know, at least look appearing to be good buddies. That's more accurate. Anyway, a, a truce. You know, smoke a peace pipe. You know, to play peacemaker between former and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell ahead of the 22 midterm elections when Republicans seek to retake control of the Senate. Okay, so here's Lindsey Graham here. Here's Lindsey. Thumbs up for President Trump. There he is. Okay. President Trump. Mitch has helped you many times during your four years in office. You know, this is he's trying to convince President Trump to kind of go easy on Mitch, you know. Four years. He helped you many times in, four, in your four years. After January 6th, he only spoke out to get a load off his chest. He was very agitated and upset about the whole thing, you know, and he, he just had to get this out. He was like a, it was sort of like a catharsis of some kind, you know. He just had to boom it out, and he really didn't mean it against former President Trump, what he said. He was just upset, and he had to get it off his chest, you know. That's what he's trying to smooth it out, you know. Your feud with Mitch 
will and he's talking to President Trump, uh, the former President Trump. Your feud with Mitch will split our Republicans ahead of the 2022 midterms. Your great plans need Republicans in control of the Senate. So if, if this, if Republicans don't get control of the Senate by, and in 2024 they don't have control by 2024, and he's gets elected, then he's in the same position that Biden is, is in, right? Uh, he, he, you know, he, he and well, Biden has control, but he'd be he'd be in a weak, even a weaker position than Biden is in actually because the Republicans are split. So this is the, what Biden is facing is not only hostile from the, the uh, Republicans, but he's, play, he's facing a split Democratic Party. That we got the progressives, but with Bernie Sanders, and then you got Joe, and you got Manchin, who's, who's more of a, a moderate Democrat, you know? So you got all these, these, these uh, splinter, uh, and you have I hear a few others, you know? So on, on both sides, so you, he, he's facing that, but the greatest challenge to him, where, where he can address it, is in, in his own party. But he, Trump, would be facing now a, a, a Senate that that a, a Democratic Senate. I mean, forget that. So so Mitch McConnell, so Lindsey Graham here is trying to to reason with former President Trump to, to tell him to look ahead to the future that we need for your plans and all your great plans and ideas that you have for the country. For them to be implemented, we have to get control of the Senate in 2022, and then put it on on the course for a whole a holding pattern for you to take over in 2024 and exercise your plans for the country. So that's what he's basically saying to former President Trump. Now, and here's former President Trump responding here. There he goes. There he is. And he's saying, we'll see what happens. Senator John Kennedy, as Republican Senator John Kennedy, said, my odds of ousting Mitch would be that of a donkey learning to fly. So he has a much, so, so the, so, so former President Trump's odds of ousting Mitch McConnell from his power seat in the Senate, you know, putting someone else there, that's what, that's what it comes down to, would be the same odds of teaching a donkey to fly over the Capitol. Uh, of what? You know, the, the Capitol here. Here's the Capitol. Same odds, okay? But I know a Republican Trump loyalist. Here's a thing. This man here in the donkey. I know a Republican Trump lawyer, Senator, I could teach to fly. So this man would be taking over the Senate, teaching this donkey here, who, who you could figure it out. If you can't figure out me telling you, ain't going to change nothing. So you think about that, and there's flying with the birds over the Capitol. Use your imagination. There's the Capitol. And there it goes, the donkey. Okay. <laughs> All right. Numero uno de la semana. Okay, here we have now. This is Macron, the latest uh, uh, controversy with Macron here, with Biden over the nuclear submarine deal, okay? So here we have the United Nations. And these are buildings in New York. On the east side here, the cars coming along. And Biden, I've set this cartoon up for Biden and French President, President Joe Biden and French President Emmanuel Macron to meet on the, in the sidewalk somewhere a chance meeting, coincidentally, before going into the UN for their get together there. Okay, at the UN. Okay, and this was supposed to be on uh, on affairs, on national affairs, in terms of this was really uh, Joe Biden's thing here. Okay, that he he wanted the U the Europeans, and he wants to bring everybody together here at the UN. Okay. So 
Here we have it. Here's the introduction to the cartoon. This is, this is, here it is, the building surrounding this United Nations here. Villa, I want to zoom in on the UN. Okay. And there are the buildings here. Okay. Introduction. President Biden has by chance meeting with French President Emmanuel Macron at the United Nations. Amid French anger, they took their ambassador out, out of, uh, they withdrew their ambassador from the United States. This has been a whole pretty big uh, production here. Amid French anger over Australia canceling a nearly $100 billion contract to buy French conventional submarines. Because these, these were conventional, so these weren't, I assume they weren't nuclear submarines, you see. So they were just conventional French, in fact, they said they were going to buy this, they were going to buy this from the French, French, French conventional submarines bought from the French, in favor of nuclear-powered subs built with U.S. technology. So they're going to, they, they broke that contract, oh, I don't know if it was a, I don't know, I don't think it was a contract. It was an agreement, an oral agreement they had, probably, and maybe they signed a few papers here and there, preliminary, but there was no final deal, and that's the, they broke it, and they broke it, and this was, an, France is an ally of us, and they, they helped us during the Revolutionary War, you know, and they, they gave us the Statue of Liberty as a commemoration to, 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 to our liberty, to our liberty from, from England, you know, so, um, so what they did, well, let's go on with this here. Given last July a second miniature version of the Bronze Statue of Liberty that's on Ellis Island in Manhattan, you know, if you ever went on the Circle Line, I remember when I was a kid, uh, they took us around on the Circle Line, we went around Manhattan Island, you saw, the, you, you saw the Statue of Liberty there. I remember that day, it was, wow, it was a long time ago. Anyway, Given last July a second miniature version of the Bronze Statue of Liberty on loan from France for 10 years was inaugurated on the premises of the French ambassador's residence in Washington, D.C., alongside U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. So, so President Biden, I guess, sent Blinken over there for the ceremony to unveil this miniature little uh, uh, Statue of Liberty in bronze, saying bronze, on you know, at the, by the French ambassador there in, in a gesture at cementing Franco-American friendship, you see? So they were really, so they really uh, were glad, the French were glad that they had this submarine deal with, uh, with Australia, and they were glad, I guess, that they were doing good with President Biden, and they had, until, you know, unfortunately, there were problems with Afghanistan and this and that, but they were overall uh, content and, they gave us this, uh, to, this uh, to commemorate that, they gave us a miniature, a little, a little miniature uh, Statue of Liberty, and that's going to be in Washington. They loaned it to us. They didn't give it to us. They loaned it to us for 10 years, you know? We didn't, like, like, the, like the one in El Salvador, we get to keep that one. This one, they just loaned us to, to us, you know? Like, rent a statue, you know? <laughs> you know, we don't rent it for free, but... But anyway, they want to see how we do. For, they don't want to get too cocky. And they'll say, well, you keep it for 10 years, and we'll see what happens after 10 years. <laughs> you know, maybe we'll renew for another 10. You know, who knows? Anyway, and then we have here, okay, so President uh, Biden meets up with Macron in New York City, opposite, opposite just about the uh, United Nations here. Okay, and President Biden says, President Macron, the deal is we are working together to counter the challenges from China. It's our F dot dot security, man. It's a security, man. And you know, our President Biden goes, security, man. You know? And then we have here Macron. That was Biden. Security, man. It's our security. And then we have here Macron. There's a Macron, French President Macron. He's responding. And he's saying, but Mr. President, behind our backs, you made this sub deal that cost France about $65 billion in U.S. dollars. In other words, they, they probably had made preparations 
to build these submarines, you know, and all that preparation to build these, uh, the, these conventional submarines for Australia. They probably invested a lot of money in, in, in the expectation that they were going to get this contract and all that money now, you know, it's, it's gone, you know. So, 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 or, 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 and plus the profits they would make on, on the sale of this and it would support the French economy as well. You know, I'm sure they, they you know, can make sign a contract and the next day start building submarines. They were making preparations and that required investment. So I'm sure they took a, a beating on that. So here, so here's President uh, Obama responding. And he says, guess what? You know, then Obama, <laughs> you know, here he goes. Guess what? Okay. Guess what? To build back our alliance better, to build back our alliance better, the U.S. will split the difference and order a giant. This is bigger than the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Allen, maybe half the size of the Empire State Building, you know, half, 50 percent of the Empire State Building, that high, you know. I say 50 percent, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's a big thing. A giant $32.5 billion statue job for our West Coast with another Anthony Blinken inauguration appearance. So Biden's saying, well, we'll buy, you build us a, another, another a gigantic Statue of Liberty and we'll put it on the West Coast somewhere, somewhere maybe we'll find an island near the Golden Gate Bridge, we'll put it there, you know, some island near the Golden Gate, it must be an island around there somewhere, around the Golden Gate Bridge, we'll find that island and we'll put it up there, you know, maybe 50%, I said already, 50% as tall as the Empire State Building, but a whole, maybe, maybe five or six, a hundred times taller than the, than the one in, in, in on Ellis Island, you know, for like $32.5 billion. That's going to be a big, a lot of bronze going into that statue, big, tall statue for sure. So anyway, and, and then Anthony Blinken will be there again as he was in, with the miniature statue. He'll be there for this uh, gigantic uh, statue as well. He'll be there. So anyway, folks, again, I always say you decide. I tell you jokes and tell you the facts to the best of my knowledge, and you make the call on how you want to think. And so I want to, as we come to an end of another afternoon of cartoons of this countdown, I want to thank you all for watching my political cartoon countdown video. I wish you all the best, stay well, and think positive, and just go out there and uh, do what you got to do with precaution, take the precautions you need to take. And I want to thank you again, and stay well. God bless you, and God bless America. Bye.